Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Creating Effective Defensible Space webinar. I'd like to thank everyone for coming here today. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and go over a few things uh, before we get started here. All right. So I'm going to get this in the slideshow mode here. So um, today's uh, webinar is titled Creating Effective but Dispensable Space. Um, and I'm excited to bring to you today, we have Captain Justin Lundquist from the Monterey County Regional Fire District. We have John Dugan from the Monterey County Resource Management Agency. We have Chief Buddy Bloxham from CAL FIRE. And we have Richard Bates from the Fire Safe Council. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the people that are involved in this project that has got this going. Uh, the Carmel Valley Community Wildfire Education and Mitigation Project was started up by people like Meredith Knoll, uh, a, a resident here in Carmel Valley. Uh, without her help, uh, this project wouldn't be happening. Uh, there's myself, uh, Scott Hannum, uh, also part of Carmel Valley and Carmel Valley uh, Association member. Uh, and from the uh, Thriving Earth Exchange, we have Katie Swenson, whose help has been absolutely indispensable. And there's a lot of other people that have been uh, really essential in getting this all work, working and up to speed. And that's Pam Peck from the Fire Safe Council, Mike Kaplan, also from the Fire Safe Council, uh, Jonathan Pangburn from Cal Fire, who's just moved, uh, Tim Montgomery from Cal Fire, Richard Bates, of course, from the Fire Safe Council, and he'll be speaking, and Mary Pacey, uh, a resident here in Carmel Valley. I uh, would also like to thank some of our project partners and collaborators, including the American Geophysical Union, uh, Monterey County Fire Safe Council, the Monterey County Resource Conservation District, which I work for, the Carmel Valley Association, and CAL FIRE. And uh, this has all been brought to you by the American Geophysical Union. Uh, which has been connecting communities with scientists and providing support to tackle local priorities related to natural resources, hazards, and climate change. Uh, and they run the Thriving Earth Exchange. So before we get started with the actual presentations, I'd like to go over a bit of housekeeping rules. Uh, your cameras and microphones are going to be muted during the webinar. Uh, recordings will be available on YouTube. We'll email that link out sometime after this webinar, probably within the week. If you have any questions, please type them into the questions chat box during the presentations. Uh, the, they'll be answered by the panelists at the end of the webinar as best as they can. If we have too many questions, uh, then we'll try to get them answered and sent to you after the webinar is over. There will be opportunities to have additional questions answered after the webinar. If you go to the firesafemonterey.org, website and look at the webinar questions page, you can enter it there. There's also going to be a post-webinar survey, which I encourage you to fill out if you can, and that link will be posted in the questions chat box. Um, so some reminders, um, there's a three-minute post-webinar survey uh, link in the questions chat box uh, that will be popping up towards the end. And then unanswered questions can be put or address to the Fire Safe Monterey uh, website that I just mentioned earlier. And then we'll be also putting these recordings out on YouTube. And this is the second part in this webinar series. This is about creating an effective defensible space. Uh, the next one will be about PG&E and wildfire safety. Uh, and the following one after that will be moving towards a fire resilient landscape on May 6th. And the last one is going to be emergency planning and preparing for evacuations on May 13th, uh, the same time. Uh, and with that, I would like to introduce uh, Captain Justin Lundquist. Um, I'm going to give it to you, Justin, here in just a sec and switch it over to you. Thank you so much for coming here and presenting and introducing this webinar for us. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having us. Uh, to everyone who logged on, um, thank you guys all very much, and uh, hope to hope to be able to answer any questions you guys might have, or at least give you guys some information. Um, forgive me if I'm bouncing my eyes back and forth because my screen's all over the place. 
Um, so a little bit about our fire district. Uh, it's the Monterey County Regional Fire District. Uh, it was uh, added together with the Carmel Valley Fire District uh, approximately, I guess, about eight years ago now. Um, we encompass about 40 square miles. Uh, we have about 40,000 residents in, in that in that uh, in that area. Uh, we have a variety of different type of equipment. We're an all hazard fire department, meaning that uh, we respond to all types of fires, medical aids, rescues, hazardous materials, whatever else happens. Um, sorry. So um, why this is important to us, and um, I appreciate you guys uh, having us on this, is because we need defensible space because after this last year, you guys might have noticed that we had one heck of a fire season. Um, it actually affected us directly where usually we used to, we used to call it the uh, regional bubble because it just didn't seem like it affected us. Everyone else burned all around us, but we didn't have to worry about it. But uh, this year, pretty much about half of our district burnt up all in the middle there. And uh, talking to the old farmers around there, it hasn't burnt since 1942. Is the last time they said that that fire happened? Um, so talk a little bit about more about the district and what we have. Um, you'll hear this term probably a lot from uh, Chief Bloxham and some of the others is we call it WUI. It's the wild urban, uh, wildland urban interface. That means where wild wildland hits houses. So obviously we all have the house. I have one out here in the Highway 68 corridor and Carmel Valley it looks, looks just like every house up in the hills. So what we have is a bunch of beautiful land with homes that we all want to live right in the middle of the we, we obviously didn't want to live in a city or none of us would live down here in beautiful monterey county so we have in all of california is mostly this western side is called california chaparral which means that mix of trees brush grass uh scrub oak that type of stuff that is actually made to burn uh there were lots of natives here living a long time before us and they burnt it just to help clear the land themselves and to help uh, help make more forage and uh, help out the food supply for themselves. So if it's made to burn, what we really need to worry about is how do we protect our homes um, in the case of that actual wildfire? Um, I'll talk a little bit. I know Chief Bloxham is going to talk a lot about uh, defensible space and the actual and what the CAL FIRE does. We basically adopted CAL FIRE's inspection program and made it a little bit more towards uh, geared towards ourselves. Um, the good news is everybody uh, in our district, we have 62 firefighters that actually work for our district. And everybody here knows the ins and outs of the entire district. They know pretty much where every home is. They know every street. They know every every nook and cranny. The problem is when we get a big fire like we had this last year, it's usually not our people who are able to respond to every nook and cranny. So we had a few people that uh, got nervous because they got into spots that didn't have a very good clearance and they were afraid that they would burn up their equipment or get injured. Um, and we had some other spots where they just actually couldn't find the actual houses they were sent to because their addresses weren't posted. So uh, first and foremost for us is we really want all addresses posted. And on those addresses, if there's a split in the actual driveway or there's multiple addresses on a driveway, we need, actually, we need addresses posted at every split so we know where to go. If there's a gate going into the property or going into the individual addresses, um we need a knox key on there uh so uh it's on our website but a knox key is basically just kind of like an all-access key that we can open any gate in the district with one key it's a very secure system and we haven't haven't had any issues yet um we're about to send out our inspection flyers they're gonna go out may 1st uh we, what happens is we sound out the flyer to help you guys just kind of do a pre-inspection yourself and to start clearing your property and making sure it's ready for our inspection then we'll start the actual inspections in June where our engine companies will come around to every, every address within a three year cycle and do a full inspection of the property. Um, we'll come, we'll knock, we'll talk to you, we'll answer any questions you guys have, and then we'll uh, do an inspection of the property as long as you allow us to. Um, we do not give any fines out. It's purely just for you guys to help save your home in the, in the case of wildfire. Um, obviously insurance too, we can talk about that. I'm sure you guys have some questions about that later on. Um, other than that, yeah, we're going to talk about clearance with Chief Bloxham, um, and we'll be looking for the exact same thing. And basically, you guys have all seen our great big red trucks. Uh, we need to make sure that every one of those great big red trucks can get into your property, defend your house, and defend your home, and also keep ourselves safe in the process. Okay, Jamie. Okay, thank you, Justin. Really appreciate that. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't give you a proper introduction. Justin's the captain and paramedic with Monterey County Regional Fire. He's assigned to East Garrison Fire Station. And he's been with uh, 
them for quite a long time. Um, he's uh, also did two seasons with Cal Fire before he worked with uh, Regional Fire, and and he's born and raised here in Monterey County. And thank you, Justin. Really appreciate that intro. Um, so uh, next up, we're going to have John Dugan. Uh, John Dugan uh, works with the Monterey County Regional Resource Management Agency. Um, he's a professional city planner, community economic developer, and educator. He has a master's degree in city and regional planning from Harvard's Graduate School of Design and Kennedy School of Government. He's directed planning programs in a lot of places. Um, he's currently the zoning administrator for, administrator for Monterey County's Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, he's taught a lot at different schools around the United States. Um, including Kansas State University, Old Dominion University, Memphis State, and George Washington University. Uh, currently serving as an adjunct professor in the faculty of the University of Texas at San Antonio and Arlington. Um, he's been part of law, a lot of long range planning uh, for Washington DC's National Capital Planning Commission and served on several operational committees for the American Planning Association and, uh, and uh, is a charter member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. And he was admitted recently to the College of Fellows of American Institute of Certified Planners, highest honor a professional planner can obtain. So with that, I would like to introduce to you, uh, John Dugan, and I'm gonna share, I'm gonna change it to you, John, just give me a sec. Let's see. It's weird, I can't make you. I'm trying to make you the uh, presenter here. Just give me a sec. <laughs> He's already the oh, presenter. There we go. Okay, great. All right, John, thanks. I think I'm muted. No, we can hear you, John. Okay. Thank you, hear me now? Okay, hi, everybody. So this is a topic that uh, is of great in interest to everybody. And so I've got some screens here to share with you. Um, if we can do that now. So we can do the share my screen somewhere here. There it is. Can you see the screen now? We can see a screen, John. Yeah, um, okay. we see your screen. Great. All right. So I'm going to run through this this PowerPoint. This information here is what you can find on the resource management agency website uh, is now called the housing and community development but i think on the internet it's still called resource management agency we had a reorganization last year not, sorry um, yeah. i don't see the presentation starting i see your screen but i don't see the powerpoint uh slideshow well i have it up there um, Um, yeah, just try it again and see if that works. Okay, I, I can see the principal space slide. Okay. Yep, so go ahead. Yeah, I think we're good. All right, so as I said, these are what this uh, presentation can be found on the website at RMA for County of Monterey. Um, what is the principal space? Well, it's the buffer you create between the building on your property and the grass and the trees and the shrubs or surrounding areas. It's essential to improve your home's chances of surviving a wildfire. It'll help you slow or stop the spread of wildfire and protect your home from catching fire, either from direct or contact or radiant heat. And it helps the firefighters when they're defending your home. There's several defensible space zones. Two zones make up the required 100 feet of defensible space. First base is zone one that extends out 30 feet from your house or structures or including decks. And there you're supposed to, and this is, this is state code, really, this is the law. You're supposed to remove all dead plants, grass, and weeds, uh, remove dead or dry leaves and needles, and uh, clean out your roof and rain gutters, uh, remove branches that overhang your roof and keep dead branches 10 feet away from any chimneys, trim the trees regularly, minimum of 10 feet from other trees, and then relocate any wood piles to zone two, 
and remove flammable plants and shrubs that are near windows. Remove vegetation and items that could catch fire from around or under decks and create a separation between trees and shrubs that could catch fire. Zone two extends out 100 feet from the structure and there you have to cut or mow annual grass down to a maximum of four inches. Create horizontal space between the shrubs and the trees and create vertical space between the shrubs and the trees and the grass and remove all the twigs and needles and barks and pine cones and all those small branches. So maintaining that defensible space means keep your property lean and green to help protect your family. It doesn't mean that you need to ring, put a ring of bare dirt around your house. But through proper planning, you can have a beautiful landscape and a fire safe home. So here's a couple of slides that illustrate removing all the tree branches at least six feet from the ground allowing the vertical space between the shrubs and the trees. And because if there's not that vertical space, fire can come from the ground and just right, go right up into the treetops. The horizontal clearance, it depends on the slope of your property. So if there's a mild slope of less than 20%, you have a spacing there between two times the height of the tree. If there's a moderate slope, it's four times. And if there's a steep slope, it can be six times. So what kind of landscaping is allowed? Well, fire resistant plants that are strategically planted to resist spread fire to your house. It can be inexpensive and they can increase your property value and conserve water. Uh, you select high moisture plants that grow close to the ground that have a slow sap or resin, con resin content. Create fire resistant zones with stone walls and decks. Use rock and mulch flower beds. Um, Choose fire retardant plant species that resist ignition. Uh, select fire resistant shrubs like hedging roses, uh, sumac, shrub apples, and plant hardwoods, maples, poplar, cherry trees that are less flammable than the pines and firs and conifers that are mostly around here. So the other thing you can do to really help your, your home from catching fire is to harden it. And uh, there was a previous presentation before on Hardening the home, but I just wanted to go over a few things. Uh, because you can direct flames from a wildfire, and radiant heat from the fire nearby or plants come in there, and the flying embers are what burned down, for instance, most of those homes up in Santa Rosa a couple of years ago. I used to live there. Um, and that was because of the embers flew 20 miles and got inside the homes. So taking these necessary measures to harden your home or prepare it can help increase the likelihood of survival. Um, this is a video, but it, so this you can get it on the website. So what do you, well, maybe it's coming up. Let's see what happens here. It may take a while. Let's see. Might load faster here. Let's see if it does. Wildfire can destroy your home and property. Harden your home with fire ignition resistant materials before wildfire strikes. Fire ignition resistant materials can help protect your home and can reduce the spread of wildfire. Upgrades to your roof, vents, windows, deck, vents, and more can harden your home, giving it the best chance of surviving a wildfire. Don't wait until it's too late. Prepare for wildfire and harden your home now. Learn more from Cal Fire at ReadyForWildfire.org. Great. Okay, so when your roof, you can put in new, stronger materials like clay or metal composition, such as the, you know, the older roofs. Uh, put in vents that are much smaller to keep those embers out. Uh, cover up the eaves, soffits there, and the windows. You can put in new windows, dual pane windows will certainly help. Uh, remodel the walls with ignition resistant building materials like stucco and fiber cement. Um, services of decks, ignition resistant decks, and rain gutters keep them cleaned out. So on the Resource Management Agency website, here's a summary of basic defensible space and vegetation guidelines for property owners. These are things that you can do uh, related to the state regulations, but you do not require any kind of permit. Now, my plan is has put out there a lot of good questions about what you can do with a permit, which is more. 
So this is what you can do without a permit. And basically you can cut and dry and maintain and trim and remove all those things we talked about. And it shows there the 30 feet and the 100 feet. But when you get down to actually taking out you know, live trees or, or even some dead trees, there's another process, an administrative permit uh, that you need to go to. There's no fee for it, but it takes time and some information in a form. So we'll be getting back to some answers on that um, later on. And if you go to the website at R on RMA and put in a search for defensible space, you'll come up with these links, which are basically this presentation, uh, plus a little bit more. So that's one of the, the things I wanted to share with you. Uh, another one is this presentation. This is something relatively new. It's called Sire fire safe regulations. And right now the state of California is updating these regulations. The regulations are everything to do with fire safety except the physical space. I'm not gonna dwell on it a lot, but I just wanted to show you the kinds of things. And this is primarily for new construction. And it's a two year process. It started back in 2020. And right now the, where this is, is in a 45 day period for this fire safe uh, regulations are being made available to the public for public comment at the um, Board of Fire Forestry website, the state of California. And what these are, these are things that have happened already. And what they're working on is to do a collaboration with these different groups to come up with a new definition for building construction, uh, changes that are proposed for the fire safe regulations, um, new regulations for building construction for access. All this would be to do with new subdivisions, for instance, or if you wanna build on a vacant lot, uh, what you have to do, you have to provide better, wider turnarounds, wider access on roadways and widths and heavier road services to, to support major fire equipment, uh, not build much steeper than 16% grades, um, have the turnarounds and turnouts on long driveways so that people can get in and out if there's a fire. Dead end roads are cut in half in terms of what the width or the length of roads can be in a county or a city. Um, new regulations to do with gate entrances and where those can go. Be sure that signage is up there. Uh, as she said before, that the graphics are really clear. And uh, going into some of the proposed changes there would be to um, require special emergency water in the areas, water supply, more of the hydrants and all those kinds of things should be uh, fuel modification standards in terms of when you have a new subdivision approved uh, where you cannot build along ridge lines and where certain fuel breaks have to be located, uh, green belts and fuel breaks to align those kinds of things. So these are generally basic planning issue is where I brought it up as a planner, but they will impact everybody in the future. These will go into effect in about a year um, in terms of in the very high hazard fire zones and in the state responsibility areas um, and then also eventually in the local responsibility areas uh, in terms of new construction. One good thing though is accessory dwelling units are, are uh, exempted from these new regulations. If you're interested in getting into this in more detail, go to the state um, website, as we mentioned earlier, and you can find out uh, where to find a copy of the proposed draft regulations. So that finishes my presentation. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, John. I uh, really appreciate that perspective from the county, and uh, thank you for being here and presenting. Um, I would like to remind everyone that if you have questions for John, to type them into the questions chat box. We'll try to answer your questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, we may not get to all of them, and we'll, if we don't, we'll try to answer it after the webinar, and we'll follow up with emails to the, um, to the audience members who ask those questions. Up next, uh, we have uh, Chief Buddy Bloxham. Um, Chief Bloxham has been with CAL FIRE for, uh, on the San Benito Monterey unit for 28 years. Uh, 
oh, I'm sorry, 19 of the years in the San Benito Monterey unit, uh, 28 years total with CAL FIRE. Uh, some of us who've lived here in Monterey uh, probably already met Chief Bloxham if you've been here for a while. Uh, we really are fortunate to have him present today. Uh, thanks, Chief Bloxham, and welcome. Okay, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Uh, so just kind of reiterate what Justin talked about and John, uh, the bottom line with defensible space, it's the buffer, and it is the law. So under Public Resource Code 4291, you're required to do the 100 feet. Uh, just kind of clarification is it's the first 30 feet around your house and up to 100 feet up to or up to your property line so just keep that in mind so some of these slides will be repeated as far as what john talked about so i'll go through these first thing i want to talk about what does right look like so i've been around quite a while and i've seen houses that people said wouldn't burn and they burned and so there's just circumstances things are going to happen that's life uh, so i want to show you this little quick video and hopefully it pulls up and this kind of ties into what Justin's talking about. We're going to be out in the field here in the next couple months doing inspections. When wildfires burn dangerously close to homes, it's the preparation that homeowners take well in advance that helps determine whether their home will survive or not. But to help prevent tragedy, CAL FIRE crews are out inspecting homes in wildfire prone areas to make sure homeowners have adequate defensible space around their homes. Our inspectors and firefighters are out in the field helping homeowners identify steps that they can take to significantly increase the chance of their home surviving a wildfire. As CAL FIRE inspectors go door to door, they look to make sure that homeowners have provided 100 feet of defensible space around their homes. When it comes to defensible space, there are two zones. The first zone is the first 30 feet around the home. That's where all dead or dying leaves, brush, or trees should be removed. The second zone is the remaining 70 feet where built up leaves, needles, twigs, and branches should be removed from the ground. It's in this zone that homeowners should also look at the spacing between their trees and shrubs. Most fires start at ground level and then move up almost like a ladder from the grasses to the brush and up into the trees. Once a fire gets into the tops of the trees, it becomes much more difficult for us to stop. Cal Fire inspectors also look to make sure all needles and leaves are removed from the roof and gutters. And they confirm that all tree limbs have been trimmed up at least six feet from the ground. We are not looking for 100 feet of bare dirt around the home. We like to see green landscaping, particularly with plants that are fire resistant. Our inspection program is about educating the homeowner, but really when it comes down to it, creating that defensible space is the homeowner's responsibility. For homeowner Debbie Tosher, she understands the importance of doing her part in preparation of a wildfire. Every year I wonder what would happen if a fire came up this canyon. And that's why it's important for my husband and me to be ready and prepared for a wildfire. Cal Fire inspectors and firefighters are out inspecting homes for defensible space. But Cal Fire officials stress it's the steps that homeowners take now to get ready that can mean the difference when a wildfire approaches. For more information on defensible space, visit the website readyforwildfire.org or contact your local fire station. Okay, so uh, just to confirm you can see that, Jamie, as far as my screen. Yes, I can see it, Chief. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to beat it into the ground. We have the two zones that we talked about. We have the first zone and the second zone. And, and the reality of it is the, the more that you can make it clean, the more survivable the house will be. Uh, one of the things they asked me to talk about was when do we make decisions to stay and go? And I'll talk about those in a second. Um, not going to belate these any longer. We talked about it 30 feet around the house, not down to dirt, those type of things. So uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, zone two continues as far as what we're looking at is that 100 feet and or up to the property line, talking about your tree spacing and things like that. The reality of it is, if a fire is gonna be hitting your house, that's really where we're gonna be taking action is trying to prevent the fire from getting into that zone one or IE 30 feet around your house. So those are things to think about when you're out there. So there's things that uh, people have asked me and I was asked to talk about a little bit. So why did my house survive? Why did my neighbors not? Those are the things we look at. Well, the first step of that is, is you doing your 30 foot clearance and doing your 100 foot clearance. With that being said, is that when we go into an area, there's a lot of times whether or not we go into regionals area or I'll go down to Los Angeles, I'll go to San Diego, all the firefighters are looking at the same thing when we decide to go into these places because they may have not seen them during the day. So we use a term what's called s -facts. So the first thing we're going to do is we show up. Is it survivable for the homeowner that's there now? Is it survival for us as firefighters if the fire were to come and hit that? The things that we look at with that are one is the 30 foot clearance if there's 30 foot clearance and we're going to make a decision we might stay a little bit longer if there's not chances are that we're going to leave 
So once again, it's back to you preparing, getting that 30 feet, and then that next uh, 70 feet up to 100. That's something we're going to look at when we drive in there. So one is a survival for us, and it's survival for the homeowner that's there. Next thing we're going to look at is a fire environment. Um, so you saw in the video they talked about ladder fuels and things that happen to travel. The thing we're going to look at is we're going to make sure that we can survive if the fire were to hit uh, the house and things like that. So that being said, if we have a fire that gets up into the ladder fuels, we may not be able to stay there long enough to do any defense on the house. So once again, it's back to the 30 feet and the 70 feet up to 100. Access. We already talked about access. It was talked about one of the requirements in the county. Can I get in there? If I can't get a fire engine in there, most likely we're not going to try to defend the house. And that's just the facts of life. Then we go into construction. So we talked about hardening the structure. As far as hardening the structure, making sure the, uh, the, the vents are protected, make sure the windows are somewhat double pane if we can do that. And are we dealing with a wood shingle roof versus a tile versus a comp roof? Those are things that we look at. And then also time constraints. How much time do I have the fire to get here? So I already talked about it. If you do not have a 70 foot clearance from your house, the fire is gonna travel faster. Thus, we may not be able to spend as much time there. So those are the things that you wanna think about when we're there. And then the question becomes stay and go. So based on the facts, the yes facts, we make a decision to stay and defend, prep and go, meaning that we might prep the house, do what we can do and we'll take off or we'll prep and defend. Uh, I've been doing this a long time and I've been at houses that uh, I'll make a decision is we're not going to save this house. And it's not a fact of something that we didn't do. It really relies on what the fire environment's doing in a combination with the homeowners, what they've done or not have not done for us to be successful. And those are the things that we kind of look at. Um, fire environment, spend a lot of time with these. We'll just kind of blast through this. Talks about, once again, what can I do around there? Top of a drainage, uh, narrow driveways and things like that. So let me escape from this, um, get back over here, close current tab. So with that being said, um, starting from the beginning, we want to make sure we had that 30 feet in zone one, zone two out into the 70 feet, between the 30 and the 70 that allows us to be successful in coming and protecting your house. So once again, to the SFACs, you know, we're going to show up to your house. Those are the things we look at. And it's back to the original question is, why did my house survive? Or why did my neighbors not survive? Those are the things that we'll be looking at. And as Justin mentioned, uh, we're going to be starting the next couple of weeks. We have a partnership with the Monterey County Regional Fire. We'll start inspecting there, as well with the me inspecting down the coast to Big Sur, and as well out in the Kashawa and Tassajara area and stuff like that. So, and that's it. All right, thank you, Chief Box. I really appreciate that um, great uh, presentation. Uh, and again, a reminder to ask questions in the questions chat box for Chief Box. If you have them, go ahead and enter them in now. Um, and we'll try to, like we said, we'll try to get to many of them as we can at the end of the webinar. We'll have some time to answer some questions, um, but uh, we may not get to all of them. Uh, so up next, I'd like to introduce uh, Richard Bates. Richard Bates uh, currently is uh, on the Fire Safe Council of Monterey County uh, Board. Um, he's worked with Pacific Fire Management, um, which is a landscaping defensible space company, is a contractor. Um, he's a chair for the Firewise USA Committee, uh, which has recently added two new Firewise communities in the Carmel Valley area, which is great news. And he, uh, his uh, background is in, uh, he's got a BS in biology and a BA in chemistry from Long Island University. And he's got a doctorate in chiropractic from New York uh, uh, Chiropractic College. And um, Richard, it's great to have you on here. Thank you for uh, being here. Thank you, Jamie. Let's begin here. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Richard Bates, and I am with the Fire Safe Council for Monterey County. <clears throat> the Fire Safe Council is a local nonprofit that is the mission of the Fire Safe Council is to educate, inform, and help our Monterey County residents become more knowledgeable about wildfires, the wildfire risk and steps they can take to protect their home, their property, and their neighborhood. 
The program that I'm going to get into in just a little bit is Firewise USA, which is a volunteer program sponsored by the National Fire Protection Association, uh, which is residents reducing wildfire risks. Here we have a map of Monterey County. And if we look at the legend here, we can see that a good amount of Monterey County is in the very high to high fire danger reason, region. This map is, there are six fire protection districts that are annotated in this map. And the reason why I have those annotated is I wanna start with the end of your defensible space projects. When you do defensible space, invariably you are left with brush and clippings. Later on in the series, there will be a presentation by one of my colleagues from the Fire Safe Council on a Monterey County community-wide chipping grant, which is going to take place in these districts. So if you do reside in any of these fire districts, please visit our website, firesafemonterey.org, where you can register for our chipping program and get more information on that program. So the facts are, we all live in a high to very high fire danger region. And as some of the presenters before have alerted us to, many communities in our region lie within or adjacent to heavy forest. The reason being they're beautiful places to live. Unfortunately, wildfires are an intrinsic part of the natural forest ecosystem. The reality in California presently, last year we had the largest number of acres burned in California history. While over 10,000 wildfires burned 4.3 million acres across California. That size represents three quarters the size of the state of New Jersey. On top of that, we just experienced the third driest winter in California history, where we received only 50% of our average precipitation. What effect does that have? Well, there is a wildfire weather research center at San Jose State University and they've been conducting measurements in the Santa Cruz area in which they measure the fuel moisture content of local vegetation, chaparral, chemise, and so on. And they've been doing this compiling data for roughly 20 years. The bottom line, average fuel moisture content should be 130, 140%. Low is 115, and the study that they just completed showed the fuel moisture content at 97%. And the single most important factor to determine the amount of fuel available to burn and how much fuel might be consumed during wildfire is the fuel moisture content. So things for 2021 are not looking especially good. Fire threats may approach from external sources, and a wildfire may approach your development from any direction. And we've also heard about embers, which can reach miles ahead of the flame front. Embers are important because they are the single most important cause of homes igniting during wildfire. And various estimates place that responsibility between 60 and 90% of structure fires. <clears throat> also, there is an internal fire threat, a fire that, a wildfire that gets into a community or just a fire starting within the community, structure to structure fires, often the greatest risk. And we've seen this with communities wiped out and brush surrounding the community where the internal fire threat was the greatest hazard to the community. This is a statement from the International Association of Fire Chiefs. And there's two things that I would like to point out here. One, that many homes are destroyed during the early stages of a wire fire. Um, fire fighting resources cannot get in to start to protect a neighborhood until 
all individuals have safely evacuated. Evacuation is a entirely different topic and we will be addressing that in the May 13th, uh, the May 13th presentation of this series. Also, homes and communities in the wildland urban interface, the WUI, as Justin had mentioned, they should be designed to withstand fire without any fire resources assigned to them. That is one of the functions of defensible space. So the reality is, it's not if a wildfire happens, but rather when. In a major fire, there will not be enough fire suppression resources to protect every structure. However, homeowners can have a powerful influence on determining whether their home will survive or not. What to do first? Well, according to the California Department of Forestry and CAL FIRE, the most effective way to reduce wildfire risk to structures is to reduce fuels to safe levels by creating effective defensible space and preferably community-wide defensible space. And that's where I'd like to spend my time is not only defensible space, but community-wide defensible space. Why is creating defensible space very effective? What we have here is a fire triangle. And once a wildfire has begun, the various features in and around that area will play differing parts. Whether, as we know, when there's high winds, low humidity, that increases fire risk. When there's steep slopes that are subject to uh, updrafts and greater wind conditions, as well as difficulty in access. Two, two sides of the triangle that are very hard or impossible to influence. Where we can have some influence is the fuel. The amount, the arrangement, and the moisture content of the fuels in and around our house and in our communities. As we've seen before, defensible space is a buffer created around your home to reduce the likelihood, you're trying to create a separation between those things that will burn and your home. The more you can have that separation between combustible items and your home, the safer your home will be. What you want to do is eliminate, and not always go eliminate, but maintain your vegetation, making sure that dead material is removed, and vegetation is well irrigated, the first zero to five feet out from your home is a critical area. And also, as mentioned before, defensible space is a zone also created to allow firefighters to more safely defend your home. As we heard from Chief Bloxham, that goes into their triage when they come into a neighborhood. Is there defensible space? Can my firefighters defend this home and this structure safely? Why community-wide? Well, as we heard before, we're attempting to create 100 feet of defensible space. What happens if your defensible space overlaps your neighbor's property? Well, then their defensible space becomes yours and yours becomes theirs. So your home is not an island in a community, particularly if your neighbor is within 100 feet of you which is the majority of Monterey residents. Okay. And the community-wide allows us to create overlapping ignition resistance zones between your house, your neighbor's house, and the more homes within your neighborhood, the goal, not only reducing the ignition resistance of your home, but reducing the ignition resistance of your neighborhood. <clears throat> What is FireWise? FireWise is a self-directed self-help program that allows you to make fire safety improvements within your development. The process is relatively simple and straightforward. The first step, forming a board of committee of your neighbors so that you can implement the program. It can be as few as four or as many as you'd like. 
And then once you have your board formed, then you conduct what is called a community wildfire risk assessment, looking at your community to see where the risk is. That'll allow you to gain insights into where your problem areas are. Are they protecting vital infrastructure? Are there homes that are just fire traps within your community? Are there roads that need uh, improved clearance? Once you gain those insights, then the findings from that assessment are coalesced into a community action plan. What exactly is your community going to do about it? And it allows you to lay out a multi-year hazard mitigation plan to get the community involved to undertake those tasks that you've identified in your community assessment. Then the goal is working towards reduced fire risk. Projects to create a more fire resistant, fire tolerant neighborhood and reducing hazards to you and your property. Gaining improved awareness of fire safety issues and good practice. And public education is a requirement of the FireWise program. It's emphasized and it also is an integral, essential part of the fire preparedness process. Then take action. Requirements of the program are one educational outreach event annually. A very common one is the first Saturday in May which is the Community Wildfire Preparedness Day, but it doesn't have to be. Every community is different, every neighborhood is different, and you can tailor that to your particular neighborhood. Complete the wildfire risk reduction in your community, and then applying via the online portal at the FireWise USA website. Some of the benefits of the FireWise program it provides a framework for action for each community, allows you and your neighbors to learn about wildfire, establish some peace of mind, knowing that you are doing things to protect your home, your neighbors, and your neighborhood. Build citizen pride, publicity. We recently had an event in Rancho Tierra Grande, one of the Firewise recognized communities in Monterey County, and they did a inspection with their residents conducted by uh, a battalion chief from Monterey County Regional, and they had a nice little segment on KSBW News on the past weekend. Becoming Firewise also enhances the community's opportunities for funding and assistance, and there are also insurance discounts available through Mercury Insurance, USAA, the California Fair Plan, and I believe we're now starting to see some discounts being offered by other insurance companies. To maintain certification is very similar to the initial requirements, holding a FireWise educational outreach event annually. The community investment is one hour per dwelling. There's a minimum of eight dwellings in a community to attempt to become a firewise community with a maximum of 2,500 dwellings. And the renewal is submitted annually through the firewise portal. The app update of your action plan is accomplished every three years. For additional information, on the Fire Safe Council for Monterey County. Uh, in order to register for that chipping program and uh, ask any questions, I direct you to the firesafemonterey.org website. And more information on the Firewise USA program can be found at the nfpa.org website. And with that, Jamie, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, Richard. That was a really super informative presentation. Uh, awesome, a lot, a lot of stuff there. And if you guys need more information, uh, you can uh, contact Richard at the Fire Safe Council website uh, or, or, or get more information for yourself at the Firewise portal. Um, 
So uh, I'd like to remind everyone, if you have questions for Richard, to uh, put them in the question chat box. Um, we will try to answer some. Um, and before I turn it over to the questions, I'd like to remind people of a few things. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you to everyone that presented, uh, Chief, uh, Chief Justin Lindquist, uh, John Dugan, Chief Bloxham, and Richard. Thank you so much for that, uh, taking time out to do that. Uh, very informative. Um, I also like to say that our next webinar series is was scheduled for Thursday, April 29th. We're not sure if that's going to occur on that date because there's a conflicting uh, webinar with Senator Laird at the same time. Um, so we're trying to find another date and time for that. So please stay tuned uh, for that information. And uh, uh, I think that's it. I would like to turn it over to questions from uh, Katie Swenson is going to handle that. So Katie. Thanks, Jamie. And thank you, everyone. So if I could get all of the panelists to turn on their cameras and their microphones, that would be great. We have a ton of questions. Let's see, I'm just making sure that I did not mute people. Okay, great. All right, we have tons of questions. So um, first, who to confirm, who do we need to call for an inspection of our home and property? And what is the process um, for going through to request someone coming out to do an inspection? Okay, I can field that one for, uh, if you live in the actual Monterey County Regional Fire District, um, you would contact our administration office um, and they would immediately find out one you might be on the inspection list already for the year but if you're not and you are requesting one for an insurance purpose or just you'd like one anyway and like to talk about fire safety um, mm -hmm. find out where you live and which station responds to your uh, to your residence and they will send somebody out directly if you happen to live outside the fire district uh, even if you call our district or call our district office, they will probably refer you to either Cal Fire or one of the other neighboring districts if that's where you are. Great, thanks. And a follow-up question: During that inspection, um, do the homeowners have a chance to meet with inspectors? Is that a scheduled inspection with the homeowners? Um, so if you call and request an inspection, it will be. We always do it face to face. Um, that way, if you have any direct questions, we can answer them right there. We can walk around the property with you, um, show you what you're needing, if anything, um, and where you can make improvements and what else we can do for you guys. Um, so yes, you will, if we're doing our regular inspections, the engine company will come out in the big red fire truck. That's the best part of it. So you can see what brush we're hitting, where they can't get in, how long it takes to turn around, some of the safety issues we might have and, and what we need. If you request an inspection, it may be, uh, we might send the engine company again, or it could be a individual with like utility with like a small pickup that might do the inspection, but they are all face-to-face. -face. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, one, one last follow-up question to that. Uh, what if someone is a renter? So they have a little less control of the structure, but they can make some changes around um, their own, um, dwelling and maybe can influence their neighbors absolutely um so the actual responsibility is on the owner of the property so okay. the renter doesn't the renter doesn't hold any responsibility as far as that now if the renter is getting kind of some flack from their property owner where they want to make some changes um they could easily just refer them to us we can just do an inspection and the property owner will get an inspection um and chief Lockton can talk talk more about that they actually you know fines can be levied we actually try we try not to do it but if it becomes such a problem that uh becomes a hazard then it can be referred to cal fire and they can actually take further action on that that's correct yeah and that that's a great follow in to, uh, follow up to um or lead into another question that we had um so why why aren't people typically fined or at what point does it get to a fine so, so typically we'll do three inspections we start out with the first inspection we usually give them 15 days hey you need to get it improved uh if you don't we go back out and we'll go to a 30 day and then uh from a 30 day we can go to a 90 day and then ultimately ends up in our prevention office and so we have cited people 
but you know, the biggest thing is we want to make sure we're educating people. Uh, and most of the time, most of the time, they don't know what they need to do to comply. So whether or not we were meeting with them or give them the information, but uh, you know, our last resort is to cite them. We can cite them based on the public resource code. That's not the route we want to go down, but it can take place. Uh, we try to mitigate it the lowest level as possible. Great, thank you for that clarification. So then I think the next question should be, well, so how, how do you deal with neighbors that um, have obvious violations of defensible space and they are directly impacting your own survivability? So that's actually a very, very common occurrence. Um, most of the time they do start out basically as an excuse for a neighbor complaint, which obviously it's a fire hazard. So if it is a fire hazard, then we can deal with it on that that um, on that on same regulation process. We're gonna come do an inspection. If we just happen to notice, it's kind of, hey, your property's fine, but your neighbor's property, especially where you see it a lot is shared driveways, where you know it's like, hey, that's not my property, but I can't get him to trim that tree or we have an issue there. So um, there is that hazard process that the chief was talking about um, and it all basically starts with the inspection so if you feel your property is good and your neighbors are not having it it's they're not doing a very good job it is um, completely anonymous you can call in and just say hey look my you know my neighbor's property is really having an issue and we'll kind of just do an under the radar check drive drive up there and because we'd like to check them all anyway so um, we want them all safe so if they're not on our list all already we'll come out and we'll do we'll do an inspection on that property as well Great. Hey, thank you for that information. Okay, so now thinking a little bit about uh, vegetation. So if there are some pine trees around the neighborhood um, within 100 feet and maybe quite a bit closer, um, and there are a lot of pine needles on the ground, um, what is cons what is needed to be safe there? Do we need to be cleaning up the pine needles? Um, is there anything that you need to do about having neighborhood pine trees within 100 feet? I think I can answer that for a second. I think, you know, it's like anything, anything in California is gonna burn if the conditions are right. We saw what happened on the Angora fire and uh, I think it was 07 and when it happened up there, the reason those homes or contributed to those homes was pine needles. They're using the pine needles to filter out the in a sense to keep the lake blue well they found out is also a contributing factor so i just think you need to clean up you know some common sense you don't want a three feet deep of pine needles if you can get it down to six inches four inches that's fine it doesn't need to be down to bare dirt in all cases like we're talking about because you could still have issues getting into pine trees as far as removing of the trees you gotta fall under the county ordinance whether or not it's a hazard based on the size and those things like that i'd refer back to the county as far as the ability to remove different types of trees uh, yeah, Chief Bloxham also had a had a there were a couple of great slides that he shared, and I think a couple of the other other folks shared them as well. Is uh, a big thing is aerial fuels or ladder fuels. You'll hear that surface fuels or stuff on the ground. Uh, ladder fuels are things that carry those fuels up into the trees, so those are become your aerial fuels. It's perfect. I'm six foot tall, so when I walk around doing the inspections, I just walk right underneath people's trees. I say if it hits my head, it's six feet, so it's perfect. But otherwise, if you got a bunch of accumulation on the ground where it might spread and then carries up into another fuel, carries up into another, it just makes for a really hazardous situation. So, you know, pine trees, the Monterey pines love to burn, especially when they get all that nasty sap all over them. But um, a great thing is just kind of limb them up, take all the bottom branches off them, get them up off the ground. So if it does climb, it's a slow, steady climb and you don't get any really just area conflagration. Great. What about um, rose? Mary, if you have some rosemary planted in front of your house or in pots, some places it's listed as a fire resistant plant and other places it's listed as highly flammable. Do you guys have any thoughts on rosemary? Probably Richard on this one because he's the uh, he's the biologist. He probably knows how all the <laughs> all the chemical makeup of rosemary. Uh, I, I do not know the chemical makeup of rosemary unfortunately um but one one very handy resource is it's a website called calscape and you can put in your area and it will tell you what the native plants are to your area by zip code 
and that's a that's a good place to start to find out if something if you should be planting something or not great thank you so this question is for john uh, how can a homeowner obtain expert rma advice on the ground for obtaining recommended clearances between oak trees in an oak woodland environment well, what RMA does, um, our staffs are not biologists, they're planners and they're technicians. So basically we defer to the fire marshal office, the regional fire district. Uh, we work a lot with Dorothy Priolo, the deputy fire marshal. Uh, you can re request an administrative permit to remove plants or put in the landscape, special fire resistant landscape. Um, and working with her and working with her staff, uh, we can come up with a plan, and then you can, right now the staff uh, counter is closed at the, at the county, so you can email in a request, um, but it needs to have a dialogue or something from the, the um, fire management district there from Dorothy's office that says, yes, this looks like a great idea, and uh, we agree with it. Great. And then along those lines, um, why does someone need a permit to remove dead trees? Well, first of all, it's a county ordinance or regulation. Secondly, a lot of the, some people really don't know if it's dead or not. Uh, it look, may look dead, it may be alive, it may be a special habitat for a certain kind of endangered species. There's lots of reasons why those regulations were put into effect years ago to help maintain the environment. Um, I've had on my property trees taken out that are looked dead, adjacent properties, uh, but I had a, a specialist check them out to be sure. And um, that is part of the permit requirement to just get that clearance. And um, if it's dead, it can come down, particularly if it's a hazard. And then, so are the arborists that are on the RMA's list of approved arborists, are they trained in defensible space requirements you know i believe they they know what they are um most arborists in this county certainly know what trees burn and what don't and whether how to recognize what's alive dead what diseases they have and whether they have a chance of living we, we have applications every week for taking out trees particularly for with new construction of homes and so we depend on those arborists to give us the technical evaluation that then we can make the finding that yes they are diseased or yes uh, they are hazard and we can take those out in new construction now the same should apply for defensible space clearance great i'm going to jump around a little bit here so we had a question um that said, I'm considering installing roof sprinklers around the perimeter of my home to spray water from the roof gutters around the house in the event of a wildfire. Is that an effective um, method to prevent fire damage to the house? Um, I can take that one. Um, I've seen it work and I've seen it not work because the pipes will melt and you also have to determine what your water source is. Um, and also the question is, is that are you going to stay there long enough to turn them on? Those things all come into play when we're looking at those. So you could have a perfectly good roof. You've got a sprinkler system that's up there, but if you run out of water or there's no one there to turn them on, those are the things you have to take into consideration uh, when you're looking at those different types of uh, devices that are out there. Great. And then are there certain uh gels or anything else like that that are recommended so there are different gels we don't recommend any in particular for obvious reasons but uh you can go to home depot and you can find the different find gels and stuff like that we have them on fire engines so once again with the gels you can apply them the question becomes when do you apply them so if you put them on too soon they dry out and they'll burn up the flip side is if you put them on too late then it was really worth nothing so um, they are out there, they are effective. We've seen them being effective, but once again, the question is how long are you gonna stay to apply them? And some cases we've seen them apply, we can come in and spray water over the top of them. They kind of, uh, they'll get their life back in them. So there are gels, you know, I'd recommend just going online, typing in fire gels, but I know Home Depot sells like a self, uh, kind of a self kit they can do themselves. Great. 
Great. And then while we're talking a little bit about kind of home hardening, um, Buddy uh, or Two Floxum, are there any um, funding grants to help individual homeowners with hardening their home? So currently I'm not aware of any. Uh, I can tell you within like the Cypress Fire Protection District, they have the ability to, uh, you can put in for matching grants if you're a home association, but that's more for the wildland stuff like that. I don't know of any off the top of my head. I can try to do some research. I know that just recently the governor approved a bill, I think it was 536 million and some change. And there's supposed to be some money in there for home hardening. I'm not sure exactly what that's gonna entail. I haven't seen the full detail of the bills, but I think there's some stuff coming down the down the pipes for say that there may be some opportunities for that. Great. Uh, let's see. What can we do to encourage cooperative efforts to extend the 100 foot clearance beyond property lines as was done in El Dorado counties? Um, this might be, might really be good for um, Richard as well with the, you know, um, different types of, of um, just kind of ways to get communities all together, like the Fire Safe Council. Um, HOAs are always big, you know, if, if they can get together and get a whole group of houses all together, where, um, you know, if everybody does their part, it just expands the whole whole fire safety area in, in general. So um, it's kind of just getting communities together and all working as one, as opposed to, you know, this is my property and I'm only gonna do the, my, my minimum. Uh, but otherwise, Richard, if you have anything on that, I agree. I agree. It's it's a community effort. And if your neighbor's property is within 100 feet of yours, your your defensible space is shared. And, you know, not everyone in a community is going to have the same level of interest in undertaking this project. And so, you know, the community going ahead with their efforts can maybe exert some peer pressure on that reluctant neighbor, you know, if 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 your neighborhood, if your home is the eyesore and everyone around you is doing their part, then it becomes obvious on a regular basis to you and to your neighbors that you're not doing what you need to be doing. So thinking about the neighborhood, if there are tree branches, or a dead tree was removed and cut up um, maybe by PG&E um, or someone else that was clearing the roads um, and the, the branches are piled up and they look like a big fire danger, um, whose responsibility is it to take care of those branches? And if they've been there for a while, who should uh, residents contact to make sure those are removed? So I can take some of that. So PG&E is a good example is, is that we get calls all the time. PG&E came through and cut the limbs down and they left them there. So there's means you can call PG&E, they can come back. Sometimes it's an education thing. You know, there's a fuel reduction process called lop and scatter. And lop and scatter is, is that you, Justin talked about it. You bring the trees down below the six or bring them up to the six feet. You can spread out the fuels. That's, that's an approved means for doing fuel reduction, lop and scatter. So part of it is sometimes the public doesn't understand that. They think if you cut it down, it all needs to go away. Well, that's not always the case. So that's the first thing you have to identify what kind of fuel reduction needs to be done there as far as PG&E. Um, you can reach out through the fire districts or Cal Fire. They can make contact with PG&E. We can have those discussions. Um, the other side of it is, is that the roads, uh, the first question I always ask people, are you on a private road or are you on a public road? And if they're on a private road, the homeowners own the responsibility of that road. Uh, as far as doing brush maintenance, keeping stuff like that. This county road, um, I refer back to uh, John, probably has some more details on it specifically, but the counties, you know, they have an obligation to maintain their right of way or their easement. Um, I know uh, the county does a pretty good job as far as mowing and stuff like that. Um, I haven't seen a lot of roads. I mean, you get out to Carmel Valley, there, there's some that need to be removed, but for the most part, the county does what they can do based on their staffing and their funding and stuff like that. Great, thank you. So talking about roads uh, leads us into another question. 
is there a requirement to keep fire road access open 100 percent of the time and if a fire road is blocked by um, a property owner what what action should residents take well the question becomes is it a true designated fire road that's the first question you have to ask because you know a road between two neighbors property is not necessarily a fire road Pebble Beach Community Service District, they have, ident they have identified fire roads. Uh, circumstances are there are, we call the Sheriff's Department or CHP to come and have the vehicle removed. Um, I can't speak for Justin. I know they have some areas out in regionals area that whether or not they're designated as, as fire roads, question becomes is it an escape route or is it just a fire break that we're using as a road? So, you know, law enforcement can get involved with some circumstances. Okay. So, so someone should contact the um, fire district, regional fire district, to determine whether or not that's a fire road. And yeah, I, you know, I and, and Justin can speak up to it. I don't know of any, you know, minus uh, the commercial areas where we have a fire lane, which is a little bit more enforceable than what a fire road is, because we don't have any true fire roads in Monterey County to the such that, you know, they're. 30 feet wide and they're designed for a fire road. So uh, once again, you know, if it's literally blocking a gate and there's a sign that says no parking, that's a law enforcement issue. But if there's uh, anything that's in question, you can you know check with the regional district or Cal Fire and we can have those discussions. Yeah, no, there are there have been some in the past that um, they're more of just evacuation routes that were kind of designated. You, you know, you talk to usually it's a the oldest guy from the property and he says you know hey, this is this was dedicated years ago but it's all overgrown nobody's maintaining it so it was it's it, it's too hard to kind of hold a responsibility and call something a fire road if it's not maintained because if people are depending on that and expecting it to be be there and it's not then it's a you know that's a big awareness thing so i mean hoas can try and designate what they want as like hey this is our evacuation route i know we have some up on Lorellis grade that are kind of you know a quick way out but Every time we get there, there's a new lock on them because somebody's riding a motorcycle through them or something. So um, it is, it's nothing's really 100% designated, but if they'd like to work on something, they can contact our administration office. Here's another question that was just posted. How wide should a perimeter fire break be? So what's the, so the perimeter fire break? Well. Usually what we determine is usually three and a half times the fuel height. So if you got big trees, big fuel break. You got a little, you know, grass, you're dealing with brush, your fuel break is going to be a little bit smaller. And the other thing that takes into play, and, and uh, Richard and John showed it on their slides, it also depends if it's on a slope. So it really depends on the fuel type. It's usually three and a half times the fuel type is what we try to accomplish, but that may not always be the case. Great, thanks. Um, it looks like we're kind of uh, getting close to the end of our time here. Um, mm -hmm. Mike, did you want to ask a question? Can you unmute yourself? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. A uh, question for Mr. Dugan. Um, how, how do we... Um, create defensible space if we have uh, trees that are protected by the county's protected tree ordinance or um, uh, environmentally sensitive habitat in the coastal zone. Um, is there a process if the fire authority um, uh, fills out um, uh, some kind of a permit with the county to avoid all the costs and expense and delays and prohibitions uh, to actually create effective dis defensible space that may be needed beyond the minimum 100 feet required by law? Um, the short answer to that is that you probably have to apply for a coastal development permit or a coastal administrative permit that would require a discretionary approval by someone in the hearing body, like the zoning administrator or the chief of planning. Um, that's uh, the easy answer. The specific answer will be, I think, be related to how much and what 
is there that have to be removed. And that's where collaboration with the fire marshal is essential and the regional fire district officials. Um, but I do believe there's an interest certainly to work on this defensible space issue to come up with a way to creatively address these needs. Uh, most of the regulations are applied, as you've heard, to single homes or adjacent homes within 100 feet. Uh, your concern, that, and which is a valid one, certainly for community areas beyond that, need to have a process, and I think there is a process, but it involves those different kinds of discretionary permits. Mike, did you have a follow-up question to that? No, I just have a follow-up comment, which is that I very much hope that Monterey County um, will uh, aggressively work on finding a way to allow and facilitate uh, rural residents and landowners to actually create effective defensible space without having to uh, go to the cost, uh, delays, requirements, and limitations of getting permits. Um, we should be giving people cookies and milk for doing this critical work instead of threatening them with fines and jail time. Thank you. Uh, there are several more questions, but I don't want to hold the speakers here for too long. Jamie, did you want to say a last couple of things? Um, I would just like to remind everyone to check the question chat box. We posted some links for uh, both a, a survey for this uh, webinar and also to the Fire Safe Council's uh, website page where uh, you can ask further questions uh, if you feel like you didn't get time to answer or time to question them here, you can go to their website and enter them there. Uh, so please check those links out uh, and do it uh, shortly because in a few minutes we'll be shutting this uh, webinar off. Um, so thank you everyone again. Uh, and I'd really like to thank both the presenters and the audience for taking their time today to share in this uh, exchange information. Uh, fire season is gonna be on us pretty soon <laughs> with the way this season's going. So. So it's important to get ready. And uh, I'll, I'll give, uh, I think we should allow another minute or two for people to copy the links. Maybe we can answer one more question. Uh, yeah. Yeah, let's let's do one more question um, while people are grabbing those links from the chat window. Um, so can we talk about the chipping services? Again, are there um, going to be free uh, chipping services from the Monterey County Regional Fire District, or how how do people find out about those programs? It is a community-wide chipping program, which is going to start later this year. Uh, there is registration available if you reside in one of those six fire protection districts that I showed earlier on that map. Um, and that that is how you go about signing up for the chipping program and those services are provided free of charge if you want to share my screen i can bring up that map again real quickly if you if you'd like sorry yeah okay. let me change to you okay is that visible to everyone no. How about now? Yes, now we can see it. Okay. So there are, starting at the top, we have Aromas Tri-County Fire Protection District, the North County Fire Protection District, number three in the center, which is Monterey County Regional Fire Protection District. So you can see where the, the Highway 68 corridor and Carmel Valley encompass, leading down to Area four, the Keshawa Fire Protection District, and then five and six are both comprised of the South Monterey County Fire Protection District. So if you reside in any of those fire protection districts, please visit the, Mo the firesafemonterey.org website where you can register for those 
free chipping services. Great. All right. Great. Well, thank you everyone so much. We really appreciate it and hope, hope you'll join us for our next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Okay, and then Katie, uh, hi, Justin, really quickly. Um, if anybody does have any district specific questions, uh, feel free to reach out to any of our fire stations or administration office. Um, our website is www.mcrfd.org. So that's it. And otherwise, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for paying attention. All right. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you.